my proud honour to introduce the first of our four speakers. Deborah Apperson is a champion weightlifter. She has represented Australia at five Commonwealth Games and two Olympic Games, winning Commonwealth Games medals including bronze, silver and gold. She has excelled also at discus, hammer throw, national level track cycling and national level rugby. Deborah has a law, honours and criminology double degree and is a mother to three daughters. Deborah will speak to us today on fairness in sport. Thanks, Deb. slide it's very basic but I didn't want to kind of overwhelm you with a lot of um, visuals while I'm talking because I am so engaging Now, I've done a lot of uh, speaking over the years, but this is kind of my first of its type, so um, forgive me if I don't kind of um, flow uh, as I normally do. Um, I've been an athlete training in a sport since I was uh, 14 years old. Uh, much to my grandmother's disgust, I took up weightlifting and enjoyed it. Um, she wasn't too keen on that, and my brother was actually doing modelling at the time, so she was all very confused with it. With everything. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, by the time she was getting interviewed about her famous granddaughter Olympian, she was pretty pretty happy about that. Um, so I spent 20 years um, in my prime of, of my prime years training uh, and competing at the elite level in multiple sports that were just mentioned. Um, so I was I think what started off my whole career was um, after I was told I was too short and was never going to be a good thrower. Um, I ended up coming third in the world in discus in an under 18 competition. I get that fire in the belly and start to like stick it to the male coach um, and. Uh, and uh, then, you know, I went to weightlifting and had a, had a trial out there and was, you know, encouraged to come and start because they really wanted more women in the sport, um, but was probably too tall to ever be a good weightlifter. So that's how I started in the sport. Um, I did the track cycling for a season, did rugby football for a season, um, but yeah, weightlifting was my main love. Just absolutely fell in love with it from the first time I saw a weightlifter up on the screen. It was the holidays and I had nothing else to do, I was bored. My parents never encouraged um, TV. My mum was an opera singer turned teacher and my dad was a, uh, an engineer and geologist. So yeah, we didn't watch TV much. But, uh, but I watched this weightlifting competition and to my shock and horror as a 14 year old girl sitting on the couch, uh, saw this 150 kilo male weightlifter with a shaved head come out and lift um, these incredible weights. And you know, I thought, apart from thinking, seeing the veins through his head and thinking his head was going to explode. Um, I eventually thought how amazing that would be to be so strong um, and I've got to tell you, having three daughters and moving house lots of times and it comes in really handy to be strong. <laughs> um, so when I uh, finally started weightlifting, um, it was around 1999 was my first competition um, and it had just been announced that women finally had the right to compete at an Olympic Games um, and it wasn't until the Sydney 2000 Olympics um, that women got to compete. So that was, uh, uh, let me, oh yes, 104 years of uh, not competing at the Olympics in weightlifting. Um, obviously the men competed as a foundation sport in 1896. Um, there was a few world championships before that, but yeah, but Sydney 2000 was it. And there were still actually some votes against um, women being able to compete in weightlifting. I know there's a lot of myths around the sport. Um, obviously it doesn't make you sterile um, or infertile. And um, you know, I've got three daughters, so um, there's just a lot of myths growing up in the sport, in a male-dominated sport, that I really had to encounter and, you know, I became a bit of an advocate for my sport to, to show other, you know, other people that you can lift and it, you know, it's safe and all that sort of thing. Um, it was 52 years before women could compete at the Commonwealth Games uh, in weightlifting as well and I was actually part of that first team, which, yeah, went, it, it was significant at the time, but, you know, it's something as an athlete you just forget it and you look on to the next thing, but now looking back, that was a pretty special moment. Um, yeah, for 52 years women um, watched weightlifting on TV until they could compete. 
So, um, yeah, quite ironic then that I did five consecutive Commonwealth Games and my last Commonwealth Games, um, which was at the 2018 Commonwealth Games in the Gold Coast, uh, I competed against a transgender athlete, Laurel Hubbard, you may all um, have heard of this weightlifter from New Zealand. Um, so, of course, this, this issue and this debate, um, which is going on right now all around the country and the world, it's not theoretical for me. Um, it's, it's actually what happened um, and my experience. And um, even yesterday, I was down in Melbourne for a forum with national level um, policy makers and you know, heads of sport all around the country. And I was the only one in the room that really could give lived experience of what it actually felt like and give that side of it and what it felt like for me to line up to have 20 years you know, busting myself in the sport, in a male dominated sport, to be recognised. You, know, you never lift as much as the men um, for you know, various reasons that I'll cover later. But, um, you know, it, it took a lot to, for me personally, you know, as one of the, not the first woman, but, you know, one of the sort of, um, the women that really paved the way for the other girls in the sport to then line up and, and be standing on a stage with a transgender athlete. Um, it's very confronting. Um, so I'm glad I could give my opinion and my, my, my view on that because it really did open a lot of eyes yesterday. Um, initially... Right, so initially when this athlete wanted to compete in the female category, um, the only requirement was basically a GP to tick it off and just start therapy, like hormone um, suppressants and uh, um, testosterone suppressants and I don't know the ins and outs of it all, but um, basically 12 months, 12 months to get it down to a certain level. So um, although that's definitely going to be changing and, and I believe in other sports it's changed significantly, um, the requirements, um, that's, that's what happened. So, um, I will cover that later, but it's, it's basically 10 nanomoles per litre. And I found out yesterday that, um, that that's a level of testosterone. And yeah, I found out yesterday that they, there's been a study of 1,332 female Olympians to see what is their natural level of testosterone. Because I've always wondered that um, for myself uh, with 20 years of drug testing. Um, and apparently the average level is 0.67. So <laughs> I, I didn't realise it was that low, to be honest. So honestly, uh, some, some were up a little bit higher, but actually some of them went positive. So that were, you know not higher naturally. Um, so that, that really did surprise me yesterday, um, that it was so low. Um, so this athlete began to transition at 34 years of age. So had been a national champion, broken records um, as, a, as a teenage um, weightlifter, national records, um, and then took a um, significant period of time, about 16 years off the sport. Um, now it's difficult to come back after Christmas, to be honest, after <laughs> <laughs> 16 years is amazing. Um, and then to debut as the oldest ever Olympian in a foundation sport at 43. Um, and went in as a medal contender. Um, was injured, unfortunately, um, but, um, well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yesterday I had to be really careful with how I was saying everything, and now I've got to be really careful with how I say it. It's, it's a very weird place to be, to be honest. Um, to be talking in, honestly, and, and like it's, it's, it's a reality, having to have these kind of discussions and arguments, which I'm sure you've all experienced that. So fairness, to me, and this is what you know. This is what I always speak about: fairness underpins sport. It is why we have, you know, why my three and a half year old doesn't race against the boys at, at Little Kindy. It's why my girls have a separate race, girls and boys. It's because it's fair. Um, so that that is to me, um, the, yeah. A lot of discussion is about fairness and inclusion, and as far as I'm experienced that. So fairness, to me, and this is what you know. This is what I always speak about: fairness underpins sport. It is why we have. You know, why my three and a half year old doesn't race against the boys at, at Little Kindy. It's why my girls have a separate race, girls and boys, it's because it's fair. Um, so that, that is to me, um, the, yeah, a lot of discussion is about fairness and inclusion. And as far as I'm aware, you know, that the Olympics aren't about inclusion, really. It's about the best. I'm competitive down to the absolute. Like I play chess and I get angry when I don't win. So, um, you know, high performance sport is about our, our bodies, what our bodies can do, and the best athletic body wins the competition. So um, fairness to me is essential. So why having biological males compete in sport, um, women's sport, is unfair? Um, first of all, so I've just got a whole list um, of, of things that I've sort of looked up and put together, and they're very obvious, but anyway. Broader shoulders, um, larger hands, which, um, yeah, these are all for most sports, but not for every sport, but larger hands, uh, Obviously, grip strength is something that we discussed yesterday, is a, is a thing that really doesn't change actually when someone transitions, um, which is obviously really essential for weightlifting when you're picking up a heavy bar. Um, so larger hands, feet, when you've got bigger feet, you've got more um, area for force production on the platform, so that helps. 
um, yeah, which is an advantage for many sports. So men have 66% more upper body muscle than women do. I hate all this because it's the sort of thing that I like train so hard to, to overcome, but it's just, yeah, I've seen teenage boys come into the gym when I've been the best woman in the country for like eight years. And then these teenage boys come in and they're lifting almost equivalent within months. So it's so disheartening, but it's what I hold on to is I don't have testosterone like I do. So anyway, 66% more upper body muscle than women and 50% more lower body muscle. Men have larger hearts, can pump more blood around the body, particularly lungs and body tissue, which obviously oxygenates and helps you continue at a higher work rate um, and more intense physical work rate. So men have bigger, stronger bones, um, larger skeletal structure to hold more muscle, larger bones facilitate better leverage, uh, better leverage, which obviously gives an advantage. Men are on average taller, at least 10 centimetres taller, they've looked at. Um, I don't know whether that was around the world or Australia. Um, giving, again, advantage in most sports. High haemoglobin level, um, which allows the body to oxygenate the muscles. And um, on average, there's an absolute minimum of 10% performance gap. That can, that can stretch right up to, um, in some sports, up to 50%, and I've got that a little bit later on. Um, but at least 10%. Men have a greater amount of fast twitch muscle fibres, and that even in itself is huge. Because you think about any power sport, which is a lot of sports, run faster, jump higher, all that sort of thing, um, fast twitch muscles are, are important. So that's explosive power. And male man marathon runners particularly um, have a lower body fat percentage as well. I think that's probably just general across the whole population, but anyway. Um, so why biology matters? So I looked up a sports performance bulletin and I thought it was really interesting to look at the um, physiological factors, so the muscle force and power production. Um, I won't get too much into this because I'm not sure if your eyes are glazing over yet. Um, size and characteristics and the cardiorespiratory capacity. So obviously bigger lungs mean you can breathe more, oxygenate muscles and work at a higher rate. And when I did my year of track cycling, that was just a, a massive thing that I noticed was that I couldn't work at that higher rate compared to, um, compared to the males. So I did do a power output test. So you sit on a bike and you pedal as hard as you can um, for like 10 to 15 seconds. Um, and then there's one where you go for as long as you can and the intensity increases. And so as your heart rate's going up because you're having to push the pedals harder, the intensity and the resistance keeps on improving. So I did get, um, yeah, I did well in that one, but my power output test was the best one where I, I got to, you know, in 10 or 15 seconds, I got close to a 1500 watt output. And when I got off the bike, they looked at me and said, congratulations, you're the third best man in Australia compared to your body weight, compared to your power output. And I was like, oh, big enemy, it's by the way. Um, <laughs> that's the only time I beat it. Um, so the difference, um, so there was a study looked at looking at just moderately trained males and females, so not elite athletes. Um, and again, looking at the lean body mass, for example, plus 45% for men. Body fat, minus 35%. Uh, muscle mass in the lower body, I mentioned that before, but they're saying about 33%. Muscle mass in the upper body, about 40%. Grip strength, plus 57%. Wow. Knee extension, so just the knee strength and the extension, the peak torque, plus 54%. So kicking a ball, that's what that helps. Tendon and tensile force, 83% plus. Um, absolute oxygen uptake, plus 50%. Relative oxygen uptake, plus 25. Lung ventilation, plus 48%. Cardiac output, plus 30%. Cardiac stroke volume, plus 34. Blood hemoglobin co concentration, plus 11%. So you can see massive, massive differences. Um, so you can look up any world record, Olympic record, and I have not found one where the women's is better than the men's. Um, male performance advantage is between 10 and 50% on sports. So weightlifting, they had about a 29 to 34% difference in the um, abilities of men over women. Um, table tennis serve, 16 to 22%. Uh, you know, when people go, oh, it's only for certain sports and every sport should have their own policy and it doesn't matter. Well, there's still fast switch fibers when you're playing table tennis. So every, every sport, um, it makes a difference. And I can't, my whole thing with weightlifting was telling every girl, apart from halving your risk of osteoporosis in later life, doing weightlifting and weight-bearing activity um, will, will make you faster, stronger, and, and better in every other sport. Um, you don't turn into Arnold Schwarzenegger the second you start weightlifting. I mean, I dropped a lot of weight before I started putting on a lot of muscle. Um, but my whole thing is talking about um, you know, how weightlifting is so good for you and how you have to be strong, generally, in life, um, and particularly as you age. And um, yeah, and so to hear sort of, um, you know, people saying, well, it only affects sports where strength is related. I was just thinking, I don't know a sport where strength is not related, because that's the whole, that's what sport is. Um, 
And then in rowing and running and swimming, they're saying about a 10 to 13% um, increase. So, so yeah, the current, uh, every, every sport basically says, you know, well, Queensland, you know, or a club says, oh, what does Queensland do? And Queensland have to do what the Australian sport does and their policy is. And then usually that national sport goes, well, what's our international sport say? And if they're rubbish and they say ridiculous things, then they just go, well, essentially, if we have our athletes competing at this level, we want it to be in line because if they go to a world championship, they need to know what they're aiming for. And so if their testosterone levels are at 10, but we're saying it has to be at five, well then our athletes are not gonna do as well against those. So it's just such a complicated thing and every sport doesn't want the responsibility. I mean, I was on our national board for five years doing policy, not this one, it hadn't happened yet, but um, thankfully, but you know, it, it's one of those things that no one wants to be the one getting sued or to be, to be dealing with this issue. And, and I mean, the biggest thing is that, you know, Sport Australia have, have got the exception to the Discrimination Act. And the exception is that based on um, stamina, physique and strength, you can exclude someone. Now we're talking about sport, stamina, physique and strength. I can't think of any sport where one of those three is not an issue. So really sports are able to exclude someone on, those base, on that basis. Anyway, the IOC in, you know, took two years to come out with this policy which basically says it's, it is necessary to ensure, insofar as possible, that trans athletes are not excluded from the opportunity to participate in sporting competition. The overriding sporting objective is and remains the guarantee of fair competitions. That was, that was further down, a fair bit further down. I mean, I'm, in my mind, I think of all the countries where sport is never an opportunity for lots and lots of people, um, and that, that's probably disheartens me the most, really. Um, Right, so that's all very technical there. Page two. Uh, so you may have seen, uh, there's a boys versus women's website. It's yeah. very interesting. If you, yeah, I only just had a really in-depth look at it recently. Um, it shows all the performances of high school boys at the national level in America compared to female Olympians um, at the 2016 Olympics. So, you know, it's done all within a very um, short time period, very close together. Um, I found that really interesting because the 100-metre one, sprint, 200, 400, 800 high jump, um, pretty much every Olympic female gold medalist would have come about ninth compared to the teenage boys. I'll just let that sink in for a minute. <laughs> I think there was one race and it was about the 5,000 metres where probably one amazingly freak of a female um, would have come second. Um, in 50 metre swimming, it was the same 50, 100, 200, 400 freestyle. That's basically all I looked at and it was similar. It was about ninth place. Um, so coming back to like my lived experience, which no one can have a go at because it's my, my story and it's my truth for me, um, is uh, 20 years I was drug tested as an athlete. So it was all very exciting when I had my first drug test. I mean, if you don't know what drug testing involves, I sort of felt like I'd really reached you know, an accomplishment when I got my first drug test. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm pretty sure it was overseas, so it was a little bit strange in Poland. Um, but if you don't know what drug testing is, um, they basically notify you and say, right, I'm your drug tester and this is the other person with me and we're gonna stand here and watch you until you provide the sample. So that's fine, you obviously can't run away and hide, um, which people have been known to do. Um, and you just keep on drinking until you have to go to the bathroom and when you go to the bathroom, um, they come with you and you have your clothes up to around somewhere around your middle. Some people want it really high, some people want it off, um, but I usually just get to the top of the stomach and pants have to be on the floor or off, and they need to watch the urine leave your body. <laughs> um, and you know, some people like to get a good angle at it, um, but, <laughs> but they need to see it pass from your body into the clean beaker that you've selected and opened and only you touch. So a lot of people think like, like I had my drug testing for work for the first time a few months ago, and I was all there ready to get naked, and this was like, Way! <laughs> So it's very different, very different. <laughs> So, so that's what I've done for 20 years. And in fact, the last drug test, I was um, five and a half months pregnant. And when I said to her, you really can stop now because I'm not lifting anymore and I'm not gonna, uh, they actually knew um, about my third pregnancy before any of my family because I just wanted them to know that when the sample comes back, you know, not to tell anyone. Um, so, so and, and obviously, um, you know, there's blood testing used now. I was the first uh, weightlifter actually in Australia that was blood tested. Um, years back um, to uh, provide a bigger, um, a bigger testing, I don't know, for a longer period of time and for different things and it's more accurate and that sort of thing. Um, so that's pretty invasive, to be honest, um, to have your blood taken to be tested. So all that was testing to make sure that I didn't have an unfair advantage. Um, I was gender tested as a, 
I think I was about 15 um, for my, or 16 maybe for my first World Junior competition. Um, apparently they stopped that in 2000s because they found out that it, it wasn't completely accurate or it could pick up abnormalities that um, I don't know, intersex athletes maybe, I'm not sure. Um, but you know, uh, it was quite a thing at my school. I was telling everyone I was getting this gender test and my friend's like, what was it? I went, well, they get this, they get this cotton ball, um, it's like a cotton stick thing, ear, ear poker. And um, they scrape the inside of your mouth. <laughs> Friends like, I'm so glad you said mouth just then. Um, and then they do the swab and just make sure you like check your chromosomes. And I've still got that. I've still got that at home. Congratulations, you're a female. Um, so it was very exciting that day. Um, so, so obviously they're testing for testosterone levels and to make sure. So, so it can be within a range, but it's basically, it, you know, for the last 20 years I've got this whole... Um, you know, I've never seen it, but it's this whole collation of all my test results to make sure that there's no sudden spike. Um, so you can have naturally high testosterone levels. It generally needs to be within a range, and they'll tell you if it's not because there's some reason why it's not. Um, but generally, it's basically you know kept um, kept a record of, of all that. Um, but it's to make sure that you know my testosterone levels aren't where a male's is. So it, which obviously boosts your training ability, um, helps you to train harder for longer. Um, it doesn't suddenly grow your muscles, but it makes you work harder and well, allows you to work harder so that you, your muscles can repair and then get bigger and stronger. So, um, yeah, so that was 20 years of my, my competition to make sure I didn't have an unfair advantage. Um, and so to line up against a transgender athlete, um, that was hard. That was the hard part, to, to know that I'd done all this to prove it's a fair competition. I mean, in the meantime, you know, I had competed at Olympics where athletes are tested positive. I mean, it took nine years for me to wait to move up two spots in my Olympic placing um, because of two athletes, actually two medal winners, um, to have their medals taken off them nine years later. I mean, my parents were always ones that, you know, that said goodbye at the airport. Bye, don't worry, you're a winner. Everyone else is on drugs, don't worry. <laughs> like, stop saying that. Don't say that to the media. Um, so to allow transgender athletes, biological males, um, to have all those physical benefits um, that I've mentioned, you know, up to 10 or 20 times higher um, than your average female, um, to me does not make sense with a fair competition. Um, so I've heard the arguments that these larger and heavier, I don't know if you saw the Insight or um, the ABC recently, Q&A, Q &A, which was absolutely done ridiculously. Uh, you can't throw that many topics in for that period of time. Just so you know, I was called the day before after I contacted them, um, was told by someone to contact them. As my, my oldest daughter was going into an MRI machine, I was messaging it and then putting my phone away and then getting a call from a GP about my other sick child that nearly lost her eye in a freak eye injury. And then when I did that um, Q and A show, I had the other one vomiting in the in the, <laughs> in the room next door. So there was there was a lot of, a lot going on. Um, I enjoyed the Kieran Perkins eye roll. Happy. Um, anyway, I met him yesterday, and it was you know oh, okay. So um, yes, yeah, so I've heard the argument that now these you know huge males are powered by these tiny little engines um, with low t low testosterone that now they're actually at, an, at a disadvantage. And I go, well, you just said these huge, big, giant males. Yeah. So I'm sorry. That, to me, that's an advantage straight away. I noted on that show that, um, uh, that Professor Ada mentioned that speed is something that doesn't go away. And, and that was mentioned, that's been mentioned a few times in different things that I've seen. Speed is half of power. It's half of power. Power is strength and speed. So when you talk about speed is still the same, it still means that that's an advantage. So there's just so many... So yes, um, um, um. so one thing that testosterone provides not only the ability to train longer and harder, bigger, um, stronger muscles, but the, the biggest thing that I um, that hit me, this is five years ago now when, you know, I, I always said to my husband, this will not be an issue about weightlifting, it'll come up in the media, it'll be a bit of a thing, but it's not till our female swimmers are going to be lining up on the blocks against our, our stars of the sport, these gold, you know, golden girls, our swimmers are gonna be um, competing against transgender athletes. And so um, that's where that's, um, that, that I knew this would be an issue. So thanks to you know international coverage, it's um, that's what's happened. So uh, um, um, so the IOC has brought in a life ban for second positive um, because when you have the testosterone levels, it doesn't increase only the size of your muscles, but the number of muscle fibres. So once you have an increase in the number of the muscle fibres, it's irreversible. So um, it's. For some people, worth going positive. 
Um, so this weightlifter came out of nowhere. Um, she got a world record. At 15, she'd gone positive already, already got an irreversible residual advantage um, and was banned for two years, came back and was a world record holder. Um, so, last page. Sorry. Right, so last of all, so apart from all those physical advantages and testosterone and everything else, um, the menstrual cycle is one thing that was is rarely brought up, but it's something that I bring up because it affects females and women, and um, and particularly female athletes. It's it's one of those things that when you first start the sport, apart from realizing that you're going to have to get drug tested one day one day and have that go on, it's also being able to well having to talk to your coach about your period because you feel like a rubbish for however many days. Um, so the training program has to be altered around that time. You've got a higher increase um, risk of injury, um, joints are lax. Uh, I just heard about that thing yesterday, this, I can't remember the name of it, but a lo lunar something, lunar, something about your vision and your brain ability to, yeah, so that's a thing, I didn't know that, um, during your cycle. Um, but yeah, for me, at least three, three of my training sessions for three days has to be altered. Um, there was one, one um, time I remember just thinking to myself, it's all in my head, just push through, and I injured my knee, um, just because I didn't have that fast twitch, I, I just was not up to my best. So when you're thinking about potentially a week for every female athlete um, that's altered, we're talking one year out of every Olympic cycle build up. And to me that's just case closed. Um, that's, that's significant. Um, yeah, so why am I speaking here? It's not because I'm competing anymore, because I finished the day that I found out that I couldn't get a World Masters record anymore because of Laurel Hubbard, improving it by about 15 to 20 kilos on each lift. And I was going to hold on and compete at, at a World um, Masters Games, but when I saw that, I thought, well, there's no point in competing anymore. So um, I self-excluded. Um, so I, I guess I know how hard I worked for all those years to be the best female weightlifter that we've ever had in the country, the only female weightlifter in the Hall of Fame for Australian weightlifting. Um, you know, to, make the, to have these achievements, to pave the way for other girls and women. Um, but I've got three daughters as well, and they're going to be lead athletes. <laughs> Um, my oldest has uh, just come fourth in Australia in judo early this year. That's going to be her backup for weightlifting. Um, <laughs> and you know, she, she got put with the boys for training and although she's incredibly strong, she's you know, practically my size, um, not quite, she's lean, um, but uh, she, she, I can see the difference. I can see the difference in the training, um, in the, in the, even though she's stronger, there's still um, so many ways in which she's not up to speed with the boys, um, even at the age of 10, um, 11 recently. So um, I've been coaching uh, junior soccer with my um, middle child and you know when people say that it's, it's all about the um, puberty stage, it's just not. I mean at conception, a male baby has you know, a fair bit, is that my to stop now? Oh, sorry. Well, um, so, so I can see already at the age of five and six is that the physicality differences between the boys on the team and the girls on the team. Um, and a lot of the girls are getting hurt and run into and whatever and they don't want to do it anymore. Um, so as much as mixed teams can be okay, my two kids now don't want to play soccer because they're getting um, knocked around the place. So I want girls to compete in sport. I want them to compete in sport from the very low level, you know, community, basic sport, and hopefully they do it for the rest of their lives because it's so good for you. Um, so that's where, that's why basically I'm, you know, an advocate in this space because it's just, I want it to be fair. And yes, safety of course, um, but fair competition. I don't train to, sorry, I had a really good conclusion here. My, <laughs> sorry, just because my sister is in Tokyo and she's a professor of, you know, everything. And so um, she helps me. Females that pursue competitive or elite sport are not competing for fun. We want to win. And including trans athletes mean that in general, on average, a woman won't win. Even if someone's answer is to give out an extra medal to trans athletes in the same race, I think that's been mentioned, women don't, won't, don't want to come second at the finish line. We want a race to touch the wall first. Um, to lift the biggest weight, to throw the furthest, to jump the highest, the highest, the highest. <laughs> it's not to come second in an unfair competition. I have no issues with being beaten. I came six at the Olympic Games and I'm really okay with that um, because I got beaten by women. Um, I'm not okay with getting beaten by biological males. 